Hello, and welcome to another teaching from 2536. Today we're going to explore why the temple priests were held blameless for working on the Sabbath. To do this, we're going to use the story where Christ and his disciples were rebuked by the Pharisees for plucking and eating grain as they walked through the grain fields on the Sabbath. The story is found in Matthew chapter 12 and begins like this. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And how does Christ respond to the Pharisees' accusation that they were doing what was unlawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? So what was it that set David and his men apart? Why could they do something that was unlawful, yet remain innocent? Christ continues by saying, Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests of the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. So the key to understanding is, who are the guiltless? The guiltless are those who follow Christ, the word that came from the Father, those who seek to become less so that he can become more. This is the understanding we gain from what Christ said just before this. So let's go back and take another look at verses 5 and 6. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. Now we know the one who is greater is Christ. But this also includes all those who are in him, a principle established earlier in Matthew chapter 11, when Christ said, I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet whomever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So the understanding is that anyone who enters the kingdom of heaven through Christ is greater than John the Baptist. And this just begs the question, how? How is it possible that we could be greater than John, who was the last legitimate high priest in the line of Aaron in the Levitical priesthood? And that's the answer. It's because the Melchizedek priesthood is higher than the earthly Levitical priesthood, just as heaven is higher than earth, and the new covenant is a better covenant than the old covenant. Those who follow the scepter, from Moses to Christ, enter into a better covenant. That's because it's established on better promises. The Levitical priesthood, through the line of Aaron, lost its power and authority with the change in scepter from Moses to Christ, the prophet that Moses foretold would come. And with the change in covenant comes a change in the priesthood. That new and better priesthood is the Melchizedek priesthood, in which Christ is the high priest. But that's not all. With a change in priesthood, there must also be a change in law. So those who follow the change in scepter from Moses to Christ go from the Old Covenant and the Book of the Law to the New Covenant and the Eternal Law. Thus the heavenly tabernacle is greater than John, the earthly tabernacle, and the temple system. I believe this is the understanding that Paul is seeking to share when he wrote, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot, is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now Paul's not talking about just any harlot. He's referring to Gomer, the harlot wife of the prophet Hosea, who represents the book of the law covenant and the carnal city of Jerusalem below. This is why Christ said, For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath, he said this because the kingdom of heaven supersedes all other kingdoms and offers a superior system of laws and judgment. The law, meaning the book of the law, was only a shadow of the good things to come. So if those of the earthly priesthood were able to serve on the Sabbath without guilt, how much more could those of the heavenly priesthood serve without defilement? You know, those who no longer serve the letter of the law, but the Spirit. The Apostle Paul describes it in this way. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died, because we have taken part in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection through baptism, to what we were held by, which was the jurisdiction of the book of the law, 
so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So how did the mixed multitude the father redeemed out of Egypt do when they were tested? Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained or murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. This was the charge that the people brought before the seed of Moses against the father. And what was the father's response to their complaint? Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. It shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So the understanding is that the Father is going to test them to see if they will hear and obey His voice and trust in His ways. And will they continue to follow His instructions, even in their discomfort, knowing that He is good? And what about you? Will you hear and obey the word that comes from the Father, trusting that He is good, even knowing that the way will be hard-pressed and difficult? And remember, the manna ceased after the people entered the land, which also meant the command to go gather it in preparation for the Sabbath also ceased. And let's not run past this too quickly. There's a jurisdictional transition here that's hidden in parable form, just like as we see with the one moving from John the Baptist to Christ. Christ himself spoke about this in John 6, so let's explore this in a little more detail. Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from Him comes to me. In other words, those who are able to hear the voice of the Father will be drawn to His word, which is Christ. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here's the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whomever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now this should bring clarity to what Christ said when he broke the bread and said, Take and eat, this is my body. As royal priests in the order of Melchizedek, the heavenly priesthood, we have the bread of life as our eternal manna, our daily bread from heaven. So let's look at what Christ had to say about this hidden manna. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So the seventh day is holy. It was set apart in the beginning and will remain so until the end. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The Apostle Paul puts it this way, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So when is the accepted time? Today. The remedy for the murmuring, complaining, and disobedience is found in these words of Christ that no one can come to Christ unless they hear and obey the Father's call to come out of her and into the light. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Why? For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore rest for the people of God, the seventh day. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Therefore, 
There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, the word that came from the Father. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law, meaning the covenant from Horab, and the book of the law, was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is how a royal priest upholds and sets apart the seventh day. They do it by upholding the spirit of the law, because the book of the law is for the carnal man, those who lack the spirit. This is the understanding Paul had when he wrote, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate. Let's explore this in a little more detail, as there are several types of believers. First, there's the liberalist. The liberalist believes they're free to establish righteousness through their own understanding. Since they don't stand on the truth of the Father's word, they're easily deceived by the cunning of the enemy and are moved by every wind of doctrine in order to conform into the image of those who influence them. Then there's the legalist. The legalist seeks to follow the written code of their religious doctrine through the circumcision of their flesh and the works of their hands. In other words, they check the boxes in the same way the Pharisees do, and thus eventually conform into the image of a Pharisee. This happens because they're building their faith in their own faithfulness to perform their religious rituals and traditions. But this produces bad fruit, fruit that looks like pride, self-righteousness, and judgment. And they'll cast that judgment over anyone who doesn't keep the law or their doctrines in the same way that they do. Finally, there's the faithful disciple who follows Christ through the circumcision of their heart and the work of the Holy Spirit. They cast a shadow in the image of Christ by fulfilling the law through love. And this is where we see how the change in the covenant required a change in the priesthood because the scepter passed from Moses to Christ, and that change in priesthood necessitated a change in the law. You see, it's about the difference between the manna our fathers ate in the wilderness, symbolizing the written code of the book of the law, and the living bread that came down out of heaven, which is the word that came from the Father, the eternal covenant law. Understanding these differences, being able to rightly divide the word, is critical because no man will be found righteous through the works of the law, which is strict obedience to the written code through circumcision of the flesh and the works of their hands. Nor will our faith come alive without first establishing the law in our heart. And this is because the law is fulfilled through love, not obedience or rebellion. So when it comes to the Sabbath, we rest. We rest from all those things that seek to draw our attention away from the Father. Things like our career, our hobbies, our sports, and every form of entertainment, which only exists to steal our attention away from the Father. We'll rest from those things because as royal priests, we have the word of life, the manna from heaven, written on our hearts. And that heart is filled with faith, allowing us to hear and obey all that the Father has instructed, because we trust that He is good. The Apostle Paul tells us that the Sabbath is a shadow, but in order to gain the reality of that rest, we must set aside all of the ways our flesh seeks to find joy outside of Christ. The Father will often use the physical, that which we know, to reveal the spiritual, that which we don't know. In other words, it will be through the physical, earthly rest that we have in experience on the Sabbath that will allow us to understand the spiritual and eternal rest we have in the Word that comes from the Father. Well, we hope this teaching has helped in understanding how the change in covenant caused a change in the priesthood, which caused a change in the law. May you be blessed in your pursuit of truth. Thank you, and Shalom.